Welcome listeners. You are listening to a podcast from the Free People's Movement, out of Sweden. Episode 9. An Illusionist Never Reveals His Magic. Helmuth Teddy Turnberg, born in 1893, in Stockholm, and died in 1971 in Worms, Germany. In 1913, Turnberg enrolled as a cadet, at the Karlberg War College, in Stockholm, and graduated in 1915 with poor grades. He earned his poor grades due to bad behavior. After the War College, he ends up in Regiment I-13, in Fallon, where he later becomes a captain. In 1933, he is in Germany. According to some information, during this period, Turnberg is an intimate friend of Rutger Essen, chairman of the Swedish National Association, which is also a central figure in the Swedish Nazi movement. Turnberg was then recruited by Carlos Adlerkreutz, in his informal build-up of a secret military security service, later called the Sea Bureau. Turnberg officially took a job working for Torsten Kruger, Ivo Kruger's brother, in Berlin, at the same time as he received his agent training, from the German intelligence service, the ABWA. The Sea Bureau was a secret intelligence organization within the Swedish defense, during the Second World War. The Sea Bureau was active between 1939 and 1946, but was called the G-Bureau, Border Bureau, until 1942, due to its work on and across Sweden's borders. However, the organization then came to be called the Sea Bureau, after the initial letter in the manager, Carl Peterson's, first name. The Sea Bureau was set up in 1939, a couple of months after the outbreak of war, after a joint action by the then Swedish commander-in-chief, Olaf Thornell and the head of the department, Carlos Adlerkreutz. Carl Peterson and his second-in-command, Helmuth Turnberg, divided the responsibility for gathering information country by country, Peterson gathered information about the Allies, while Turnberg devoted himself to Finland, Germany, Hungary and Switzerland. Turnberg's main source of information, according to himself, was the chief of the German Abwa, Wilhelm Canaries. In order to assist Turnberg in his efforts, he had a whole army of young women. So-called swallows, or sirens, whom he had recruited mostly through his own charm. More often than not, the girls initially didn't really understand what they were getting themselves into. The girls were paid money and were sent out into the Stockholm nightlife, in order to seduce and interrogate foreign personnel, stationed in Stockholm during the war. Sweden, just as always, had maintained its neutrality, and Stockholm therefore became a base of operations for other countries' intelligence operations and personnel. Stockholm was basically the spy central of the world, considering the concentration of foreign intelligence personnel in the area, at that time. He was also often in Germany, where he was called Unser Swedischer Freund, our Swedish friend, at the German intelligence service Abwa, in Berlin. He also received a so-called Sonderausweis, a kind of domestic passport, from the Abwa, which enabled him to travel freely by train in Germany during the war. Turnberg is said to have had particularly good contacts with Fremde Hierost, Foreign Armies East, under Reinhard Gellen, who was responsible for gathering information from the East. In June 1940, he made sure that the Swedish newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, accredited him as an economist named George Bross, in Estonia and Lithuania. A special correspondent, for another Swedish newspaper, Norkopings Tidninga, he is said to have followed the German army on the Eastern Front up to Stalingrad and continuously submitted reports to Sweden and to Reinhard Gellin. It is said of Turnberg that on one occasion he hijacked a Soviet ferry from Tallinn with a locomotive on board and handed it over to the Germans. After returning home, Turnberg is responsible for transporting personnel from the Baltics to Gotland with the help of Kurt Andreasson, who was later responsible for the T-Office espionage against the Baltics. The Sea Bureau was the organization that in the autumn of 1944, on the Swedish side, was also responsible for Operation Stella Polaris, where nearly 800 people and large quantities of Finnish signal reconnaissance material, from the continuation war, were secretly transported from Finland to Sweden. 
After the war, the Sea Bureau's exchange of information with the German Abwehr was considered a burden on the defense. So, in 1946, Peterson was fired, and the religious historian Thede Palm, who had worked at the Sea Bureau since 1943, was allowed to take over the leadership. At the same time, the organization's name was changed to the T Office, again taken from the boss's first name, so the defense could officially say that the discredited Sea Bureau no longer existed. But Thede Palm and Reinhard Gellin, head of the Nazi intelligence, continued their collaboration. Remember, this was during the same time as negotiations regarding the Wallenberg family and the Bosch affair were going on in Washington. Basically the intelligence operation still continued as before, just under the name T-Office, and still with Turnberg in senior positions, although now under his cover name of George Bross. The amount of incriminating information that could be used as leverage, at the disposal of the T-Office, was massive. It's quite amazing what they keep getting away with. Since the conclusion of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact by the Soviet Union and Germany on the 23rd of August 1939, the Soviet Union had considerable freedom of action over the Baltics and Finland, as the Western powers England and France were at war with Germany. In the autumn of 1939, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania were forced to agree to allow Soviet military bases within their borders. In October 1939, the Soviet Union submitted the following demands to Finland. Finland was to lease Hanko Cape, for 30 years, for a naval base. The Soviet fleet would be allowed to use Latvik, near Hanko, as an anchorage. Finland would hand over some islands in the Gulf of Finland, including the fortified Bjorko. The Finnish Soviet border on the Karelian Peninsula was to be moved west. Fortifications on the Karelian Peninsula were to be destroyed. Finland would hand over the western part of the Fiskar Peninsula on the Arctic Ocean. Finland met some of the Soviet demands, but refused to house a naval base. Early in the morning of November 30, Soviet artillery opened fire, followed by infantry crossing the border on the Karelian Peninsula, north of Lake Ladoga and at Petsamo. The Soviets had prior to attacking Finland, staged a false flag attack, blaming Finland for a provocation attack on Soviet forces. This is of course, how the official story goes. Who actually did what, and why, might become more clear. The Soviet Union was superior to Finland in terms of numbers, armaments and equipment. Stalin's optimistic planning for the war was based on a quick victory in between 10 and 12 days, as estimated by artillery general Grigory Kulik. However, a few days before Stalin invaded Finland, the Swedes managed to break the Soviets' cryptography coding system. Throughout the Winter War, they were therefore able to provide the Finns with extremely vital information. Just a few minutes after Soviet bombing raids had started from their bases, the Finnish Air Force was notified by Sweden of the targets. Let's just say, with Sweden supplying Finland with Soviet intelligence, it made things a bit easier for them. The Swedish establishment wanted to assist the Finns, without ending up in war with the Soviets, and without irritating the Germans, who were at the time Stalin's allies, in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The negotiations were therefore difficult, as they had to be done in the greatest secrecy, so that Stalin would not find out that Germany was helping Sweden to replenish the Finnish weapons stockpiles, in the middle of a burning war. Per Albin Hansson, the Swedish Prime Minister, personally wrote a letter to Hermann Göring, in these negotiations, with the help of Commander-in-Chief, Olaf Thornell, where tanks, anti-aircraft guns, aircraft, machine guns, ammunition etc., were on the shopping list. Kurt Julin Danfelt, military attaché at the Swedish legation in Berlin, was also deeply involved in the negotiations, and met with Göring, out at Karen Hall, together with the Swedish purchasing manager for the Swedish Armed Forces, Berger Hedquist, and with the bank director Alan Wettermark, several times. Sweden had assisted Finland with so much of its stockpiles of ammunition, anti-aircraft guns and aircrafts, that its own stockpiles were increasingly empty. The Swedish government therefore, tried to buy weapons of every conceivable kind, from all possible directions, but most of all, they hoped for business with Germany. 
The German arms industry was in full swing for many years, and in addition, lots of munitions had been captured during the campaign in Poland, which would quickly fit in with the Swedish army's equipment, as it was almost completely, funnily enough, produced in Sweden. The deal itself was by no means a small thing. In preserved documents, it's possible to read that the deal consisted of 292 anti-aircraft guns, 30 aircrafts, 90 tanks and 2,850 light machine guns. During the negotiations, the Swedish legation in Berlin invited Hermann Göring to a big party, where food was flown in directly from Stockholm. Among the guests were Navy attaché, Anders Forschel, Prince Bertel, and also, of course, Jacob Wallenberg. The Winter War ended on March 13, 1940, when the Finnish government was forced to give way to Soviet demands. This ordeal had however, proved quite costly for the Soviets. The official figures are quite extraordinary. By the end of the Winter War, 23,576 Finnish soldiers had died, and 43,557 wounded. The Soviet had however lost over 132,000 soldiers, and had almost 160,000 wounded. Like we've said before, control of information, gives a massive strategic advantage. There is an official story, that a Swedish mathematician, called Arne Berling, cracked the Soviet's crypto only using pen and paper. It's also claimed that he later, still using only pen and paper, even cracked the German cryptographer machine, the Geheimfenschreiber, or G-Machine. When asked by fellow employees to write down exactly how he cracked it, Berling simply replied. An illusionist never reveals his magic. An illusion. Indeed. This is ludicrous, to say the least, but still maintained as the official narrative, by Swedish authorities. Let's just speculate a little more. What if a third party instigated this war? Would that be possible? Well, which entity is known to orchestrate false flag attacks? Maybe it's just a coincidence that it's the same family who had control of both cryptography and telecommunications, and owned stock in the German arms industry. We're betting that a narrative that would be a better description of reality is the Wallenbergs playing both sides for their own benefit. Like always. Follow us into the next episode where we will look to the stars in more ways than one. Thank you for listening.